Hey everybody, what is the good word? John Ram Dean with you here in the FN studios and this is FNN Extra, your daily dose of mixed martial arts news. Robin Black and I will be chatting about some of the big stories in the fight sport, including Uriah Faber's game plan leading into the rematch with Barrow. Also making headlines, the spider isn't going to rush his return to mixed martial arts, but he already has his eye on an opponent. A top-ranked welterweight's brother joins the world's biggest fight promotion and a former jungle fight champion will take on a former King of Pancrase in his Octagon debut. Those are just some of the stories from the MMA world. Now let's get some deets. Although we are just a few weeks removed from Anderson Silva's crushing loss to Chris Weidman, where he suffered a broken leg, it seems that the Brazilian's managers are already setting their sights on his first opponent when he makes his eventual return to the octagon. According to Ed Suarez and George Guimaraes, the former middleweight king is eyeing about with former welterweight great George St. Pierre. It is a super fight that people have been interested in for years, and it is sure to sell a ton of pay-per-views and tickets. I, for one, think it's a bout that will probably never happen. It appears that Joe Ellenberger, the twin brother of welterweight standout Jake Ellenberger, has inked a four-fight deal with the UFC. The 28-year-old sports an impressive 14-1 record with 12 stoppage wins, and his lone blemish coming at the hands of UFC veteran Justin Salas by five-round decision. The former NCAA Division II wrestling champion suffers from a rare blood disorder where he has to take the drug Solyris, which costs, wait for it, $440,000 annually. No date is set for when he is expected to make his debut. Explosive Brazilian Eric Silva now has a new rival for his UFC Fight Night 36 bout. After his original opponent, Nate Lochran, was forced out of the match due to injury. In for the American is former King of Pancrase and deep veteran Takenori Sato. The 28-year-old Japanese fighter is unbeaten in 10 straight, while his ex-gym adversary will be looking to rebound from his first KO loss in his career. Joining me now, my partner in crime, Mr. Robin Black. And yeah, there's some news, but the real news that we got to get to Uriah Faber taking on Henan Burrell for the Bantamweight Championship of the World. And Uriah Faber says, you know what, that last fight I was just trying to compete. I'm making it rough and I'm making it tumble this time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, an interesting thing. Fighters go and they create these game plans. And, you know, people will often talk about Greg Jackson or TriStar and how they're finding ways to control fights. And they do. That's what you do. You, if you can put a guy against the fence and control his arm so he doesn't hit you, that's great. If you can put him on, your, on his back and control him, that's great. And if you strike with a guy, if you can stay at distance, make him throw something you want him to throw, make him miss and hit him, that's great. What Uriah Faber is saying when he's talking about this fight now is he's going to go fight the guy. He's not going to go play a game of test your striking against his test, his striking. He's not going to try to implement his plan A against your plan C at certain times where he's fatigued you. He's going to go in. He's going to take all of that, that work that he's done. He's going to take all that focus that he has, all of the confidence and the skills, and just go fight the dude. And really, most fighters won't do that. That's not a surefire way to win. But, man, everything about the way he's approaching this fight is incredibly ballsy. The thing about Uriah Faber, he, he is arguably one of the top five most exciting fighters in all of mixed martial arts because he has a different mentality. He's made money, he's super successful, he's super good looking, but now he just has to go out there and smash people. I think he's gonna continue to gain popularity. You look at the last year, and this guy is absolutely obliterated, guys. Yeah. You look at that last fight with Michael McDonald, Hennem Burrell fought Michael McDonald, uh, submitted him, I think, in the fourth round, whereas Uriah Faber just owned this yeah. guy from start to finish. Even when Michael McDonald was moving for forward, Uriah Faber seemed to be in control of that whole fight. When you use Michael McDonald as a common opponent, uh, how did they match up based on Michael McDonald? Yeah, that's interesting because Faber was able to make McDonald doubt himself. And sometimes that's through his physicality and sometimes that's through making a guy pay for his choices. One thing Michael McDonald always could do is test your chin. He'd always land it on you. But Uriah made him pay a few times that made him hesitate from doing that. If he can do that with Barrow and he can do it early, that really, really is powerful. Barrow took his time and smartly and surgically took apart McDonald, which is actually what he did to Faber too. Faber's trying to make this not about any of that. He was a guy who fought entirely on scrambles and improvisation early in his career, and then he added all of this technical skills. Now he, they're so good, I think he's going to look to throw them out and go fight this dude. So what's, this is amazing to me. For Henan Burrell, a minus 300 favorite going into this fight, are those odds, those, those seem reasonable to you? Because to me, they absolutely do not. If you're gonna, sure, if you're going to say Henan Burrell is the betting favorite, 
It's got to be two to one, maybe even less than that. Well, the theory of taking a fight on short notice for a guy you're not prepared for without all the game planning and strategy and all that in place and literally talk about going in and approaching the fight. The reason guys structure things so much is so they don't have to roll the dice. Uriah Faber saying, I'm going to I'm going to swagger my way into that arena. I'm going to stand and face the, the best fighter in the world at my weight and I'm going to roll the dice. The odds of that are pretty crazy, unless you're Uriah Faber, who believes he's got this thing won. It's a really cool one to watch. It's a cool one to watch unfold. Uh, we got to talk about uh, the fight that's going to happen on the undercard of Musasi and Machida. Eric Silva finally getting an opponent. Nate Lockren and out. Takanori Sato, <laughs> who's in, and we had a chance to call his fight in deep. Uh, for Eric Silva, this is a guy suffered the only KO loss of his career. Uh, what does he need to do? Is he going to be tentative in this fight with Sato, or is this the perfect opponent for yeah, him? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's an interesting one. These guys like Sato, they have so much experience to draw on and so much mind to draw on, and, so, and they approach fights very, very differently. I like to look at what Eric Silva did after that fight. When he came in, and he just destroyed Jason High. A brilliant wrestler made him pay for shooting, went to his back, and clowned him with a submission. If he can make that kind of statement, if he can go in there going, I don't care who this Sato guy is, watch what I'm going to do. If he approaches the fight that way, that's probably in his best interest. But should he not be concerned with who these guys are? And I know I've heard fighters say it many times. I'm not concerned with their game plan. I'm not concerned with what they're going to do. I have to implement my game plan. But don't you still have to be kind of worried? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it, these things are all so interestingly weighed by people. If you talk to some of the winningest coaches of all time, they will say 100%, just like with the Uriah Faber thing, we must create scenarios in which you will win exchanges. And to do that, we need to know thy enemy. And other guys will say, we make an athlete so incredibly powerful, we, and we train him in certain areas, he doesn't even worry about stuff and we send him in to kill. I'd say the winningest coaches in the world fall on the side of the Greg Jacksons and the Farazes and they build strategy. But it sure is exciting to see guys go in there just swinging. And what about Eric Silva fighting in Brazil on home turf? where the Japanese fighter, however, I think the second largest Japanese colony in the world is in Brazil. So I think uh, Sato should be right at home. Sure, that's all fine and good. The worst place in the world to fight for, uh, to fight outside of your home is to go into Brazil and fight a Brazilian. That audience is crazy, the fans are nuts, and Brazilian fighters beat you at home. It's, a, it's, it's the third man off the bench kind of style. It's scary. I have a feeling Eric Silva is gonna win that fight. Don't go anywhere, more Fight News Now Extra is still to come.